the origin of the 1918 to 1920 world influenza pandemic is uncertain. One theory is that it first appeared in a US army camp in Kansas. When the soldiers were shipped to France to take up their positions on the Western Front, the influenza accompanied them. This virulent new flu infected friend and foe alike. Wartime censorship among the combatant nations meant that the illness was only reported when it started to appear in neutral Spain, leading to it being unfairly christened Spanish flu. With troop movements and repatriation at war's end, the virus spread widely and rapidly. Australia's isolation gave us time to prepare. The Commonwealth invited state premiers to gather in Melbourne in November 1918 to agree on a plan to protect the country. Their first decision was to name the virus pneumonic influenza. Initially the focus was concentrated on quarantining incoming ships, but as we have become acutely aware recently, viruses don't respect quarantine rules. In January, a Melbourne man arrived in Sydney and was declared to have contracted pneumonic influenza. This caused a breakdown between the states with New South Wales claiming Victoria had not reported a known case. The November agreement began to crumble as the states went their own way. Newspaper reports became much more parochial. The New South Wales state authorities have been putting up a most intelligent and successful fight against the menace itself, against Victorian criminal negligence and secrecy, against the crass stupidity and hampering tactics of the federal government, and against the willful disobedience of many of the citizens they are striving to protect. The virus spread quickly. Quarantine camps started to appear at state borders. In Melbourne, the exhibition building was one of several buildings hastily commissioned as a hospital for flu victims. The exhibition building already had several tenants. The State Parliament occupied the Western Hall, having been reluctantly pushed from their own house by the new Commonwealth Parliament. The exhibition buildings also housed an aquarium. Some residents had to make way for nurses' accommodation. The opening of this new temporary hospital brought a number of issues, not least of which was staffing. The Catholic Archbishop, Daniel Mannix, a man not averse to controversy, offered to provide nuns from the nursing orders, supported by Christian brothers and Jesuits. This was initially accepted by Health Minister John Bowser. Despite theological differences, the Anglican Church noted that they welcomed the Roman Catholics as independent helpers. At an open-air Sunday gathering at the Wesley Church, fiery preacher Henry Worrell was not so ecumenical. The best sentiment of the community will be shocked by the action of the Minister for Health, Mr Bowser, in handing over at the suggestion of Archbishop Mannix, who is himself regarded as anti-British in all his utterances, a newly established hospital in the exhibition building to the care of a sacerdotally trained band of anti-Protestants. The Health Minister hastily did an about turn, now rejecting Mannix's offer. This outraged the Catholic community. Archbishop Mannix responded. The issue the government has to face, as everybody recognises, is whether or not the government is going to submit to sectarian dictation. One thing is for certain that I will not allow the sisters to place themselves under the control of any department or cabinet or government, which may prove its inability to resist the pressure knot of sectarian bigots. The exhibition hospital continued treating flu patients, although staffing remained an issue. Richard Tucher, a member of the Legislative Assembly, 
expressed the concerns of the Victorian State Parliament at sharing space with a fever hospital. Order! Order! I think that if an analysis were made, it would be found that there have been more deaths of influenza patients in the exhibition hospital than in any other institution. It is a menace to everybody, including members of this house, who have to sit so close to the hospital. Dangers to politicians were no doubt mitigated as Parliament did not sit for the first six months of 1919. A range of regulations were introduced in an attempt to contain the spread of the virus. Many of these will seem quite familiar to us. Schools and theatres were closed. There were limits on gatherings. Masks were mandatory at church services. Horse racing meetings were prohibited. Our library closed for several months. With schools closed, Melbourne Hospital suggested useful work for bored school children. Which is wanted. The Melbourne Hospital desires an unlimited quantity of leeches, and schoolboys are asked to utilize their enforced vacation in catching them. The hospital will pay five pence a hundred for the black variety with three stripes. The leeches are used in cases of pneumonia and should be packed in tins with wet grass, and a postcard should be sent to the hospital reporting their dispatch so that they can be picked up at the station. Between February and July 1919, there were several waves of influenza in Australia. The pathology of influenza wasn't understood at the time. The recently formed Commonwealth Serum Laboratories developed a vaccine, but it fought bacterial rather than viral infections. It was, though, effective in warding off secondary infections of flu victims and did save lives possibly because of the immunity attained by the surviving 40% of the population who'd been infected, the pandemic began to wane. Temporary hospitals began closing. The exhibition hospital was closed in mid-September when the final patients left. The pandemic left 12 to 15,000 deaths across Australia. The worldwide death toll dwarfed the mortality of the First World War. The figures are very imprecise, but it is likely over 50 million people succumbed. While the pandemic receded, the deaths and disruption following so quickly after the trauma and loss of World War I cast long shadows over many families and communities.